before it took it up last year. Okay, Greg McLaughlin with New Jersey Forest Fire Service, 2018 March. We're here at the Silas Little Experimental Forest within Brendan Byrne State Forest. I'm with Rory Haddon, Dr. Rory Haddon from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. He's back this year again. I think folks will remember Rory from last year with his containers from the Ember study we did at the Franklin Parker Preserve in Chatsworth. <clears throat> We're back this year again to continue the research that he's been working on. Um, these towers that you see behind Rory are what I call flux capacitors. Uh, those of you folks from the 80s generation will remember that from Back to the Future. But uh, Rory's gonna tell us in a more scientific manner what these devices are, what these devices are designed to do. And then what we'll do is we'll move into a, um, a small prescribed burn, uh, which will produce some heat and some smoke and some fire. Uh, Rory, what can you tell us? Sure, so we're here today, we're looking at what happens when we uh, have a very low intensity fire. We're trying to understand how the fire will spread uh, once we have the ignition. So. We've got all this stuff here hanging in the uh, hanging off the trusses. Uh, there's basically three or four main components of this. The first component you can see hanging down to the ground. Uh, they are thermocouples. They're measuring temperature. Uh, we're interested in uh, how hot the fire gets. We're interested in the size of the flame. Uh, we're interested in how that heat changes as a function of, of height above the ground. Um, then we've also got hanging off the, the trusses just these small boxes you can see. Um, maybe Bob will talk about them later on, but there are some video cameras, some infrared cameras, so we're able to, uh, to see the spread of the flames. Um, we've then got these sonic anemometers that are measuring the wind, uh, so they're measuring the airflow that's generated uh, by the fire, but also the ambient wind uh, that we get here through the, through the canopy. Um, and then right up on top of the tall tower, uh, we've got some of the um, some more visual cameras and uh, an infrared camera up there as well. And overall, this is going to give us a good picture of how the fire spreads uh, throughout this plot here. We've got quite a low fuel load uh, on the ground, so we are uh, not expecting huge flames, um, but we will hopefully get some nice uh, uniform burning uh, and a nice continuous fire spread. Great, thank you. Okay, folks, continuing along with some additional information about the research we're doing here today, uh, March 6th, Silas Little Experimental Forest. This is Bob Kremens from the University of Rochester, Rochester Institute of Technology in upstate New York. Tell us, Bob, why you came down to New Jersey today from lovely upstate New York. Get out of the snow is one reason, but uh, I'm interested in the fire heat release, both the hot air that comes off the fire and the radiative energy that comes off the fire, and I built instruments for uh, Nick and Nick Skronsky and some of the other folks that I work with. Uh, here we have, there's a lot of beeping going on in the background. That's uh, uh, an infrared and visible camera combined with an uh, instrument that measures the vertical wind flow and also the uh, amount of heat that comes off as radiation. That's the, what you can feel from a campfire. Uh, and um, we have 16 instruments out today on about a, a 10 foot grid. So we're, we're studying in very great detail the heat release from this wildland fire. And I love to work in New Jersey. You guys are easy to work with. We have great uh, rapport. Uh, I guess Nick and Mike have worked with you guys for years, and uh, we can really get done what we need to get done as researchers. Thanks. Good morning, Ken Clark, U.S. Forest Service, Silas Little Experimental Forest. Hi. Sort of continuing on the. Uh the uh, saga here of this, uh, these experimental burns. Um, what all's in the background are boxes containing data loggers and power supplies, and that's driving or collecting data from all this equipment here. And most of the equipment is actually being collected at 10 times per second, so it's very fast, um, particularly for the wind measurements because um, 
a lot of the turbulence that's, that's produced by a fire is actually happening very quickly. And so to be able to capture that, we need to be able to collect those data at at least 10 times per second. Um, so that's what a, a lot of these are. And then all the thermocouples, the pressure sensors, the, uh, the heat arrays and things like that are being logged with data loggers. And Ken, the white, uh, the white, what looked like tissue paper on the pole in the background there, what are those designed to do? Those are actually insulators. Um, and that's insulating the, uh, the base and, the, and the, essentially the, the plugs for the thermocouples. The thermocouples can handle high temperature, but there's some connectors that, that don't do as well with, with direct flame. And so we're trying to insulate those things. And above your head, is that device supposed to spin? Is it supposed to be uh, is it a smoke alarm? Uh, tell, tell me a little more detail about that. Sure. Um, that sonic anemometer, what that's doing is it's actually bouncing sound back and forth between three sets of sensors. And they're arrayed so that they'll measure a three-dimensional wind speed. And so the principle is that as the wind blows through, as molecules of air blow through that path, they actually delay or, or increase the speed of the sound that's transferred back and forth between those sensor heads. So the higher the wind speed, the more molecules there are, the slower the signal. And that sensor is smart enough to work that out into an actual three-dimensional wind speed. Great. Thank you, Ken, and thanks for all the work that you do. And it's been a pleasure working with you over the years. We hope to continue. Great. Okay, I'm with Mike Gallagher again. Folks, you probably remember Mike Gallagher from last year, 2017, when we did the burnout at Franklin Parker. We had done the Ember research study. Uh, Mike was there and, and we had Mike on camera. Mike uh, is our resident expert here at Silas Little. He uh, is one of the research postdoc uh, fellows, I guess you'd call it. He'll tell you a little bit more about his position and what he's doing. And Mike, what I wanna know is, uh, from New Jersey forest fire standpoint, you know, how is the research going to translate to what we do in terms of protecting life, property, and natural resources and making our management decisions, you know, daily, weekly, monthly? Sure. Greg, those are great questions. Um, so all the data that we collect here uh, is going to be actually collected in, in more burns than just this one, but we'll be doing a series of burns under different weather conditions and different fuel loading conditions different fuel structures, so if you think about shrubs with leaves, shrubs without leaves, that all contributes to, to uh, the fire behavior and the, the energy release and the volatility of a piece of forest. And so by replicating these experiments over and over through iterations of different weather and fuel conditions, we can learn a lot about things like prescriptions, about fuel loading um, that aren't very well um, modeled right now. And so models are uh, computational tools that fire managers in New Jersey and in other parts of the country and world use to um, justify what they're doing in their management actions. Uh, and a lot of those tools are based in 1970s uh, research and so we're, a lot of this is going to work towards updating that. Great. And earlier off camera, you and Nick and myself were talking about the specific fuels that we're looking at on these plots. And so I'm glad you mentioned that we're going to be looking at other plots with shrubs and different types of fuels. So why start here with this basically fine fuels and not much ladder fuels? Yeah. So this is um, a, a pitch, uh, pitch pine lava lolly pine plantation. Um, and so it was clear to be a plantation uh, for research a long time ago. And that's left a very basic fire environment where there's uh, a very simple, easy to understand environment. And so that's, that represents one end of the flammable uh, spectrum. Uh, whereas a forest that hasn't been burned in a long time, that has, has had no management, um, is going to have a lot more material uh, vertically and horizontally. And so this represents one end of the spectrum. Uh, and as this project progresses, we'll be filling in the gap all the way to the other end of the spectrum of forests that haven't burned in a long time. Great. And Mike, just uh, for the record, your position, your affiliation? Yeah, so, so um, I'm a postdoctoral associate here uh, with the U.S. Forest Service and uh, like the lead research technician. 
Okay, to finish up for today, March 6, 2018, at the Silas Little Experimental Forest, I'm with lead researcher Nick Skaronsky. Uh, folks remember Nick. Uh, Nick worked with us last year, and Nick's been working here in New Jersey for quite some time now. A lot of his good research we've put into use with the New Jersey Forest Fire Service. Nick's going to finish up today. The burn uh, that you saw earlier has been completed, and now what we're doing here is we're going to talk about this uh, terrestrial LIDAR device which is the blue device over Nick's left shoulder. So you've uh, you've heard about a bunch of the instruments that we have in the plot that we're making different measurements of the fire behavior, uh, where the fire was, all those sort of fire type properties. Uh, that device behind me is a laser scanner that basically samples the whole forest and, and shoots laser beams at a really fast rate of speed and we can use that to identify where fuels are, where trees are, what the shape of the fuels are, all those things. And so we can take those three-dimensional attributes uh, of the forest and we can relate those back directly to the fire behavior. And so we can basically build a three-dimensional model of the forest canopy that we can use in a, a, a modeling environment or some other kind of virtual computer environment. So that's what that is. It's, it's, it's our power horse. And Nick, when we were talking, you and I, the other night um, about some of this work that was going on, you had given me some examples about how now, today, with this research that you're doing, um, we're able to predict a little bit about how um, fire is going to behave right down to a, if I have it correctly, maybe a microscopic scale. Just maybe reiterate what you told me. Well, we're trying to predict fire better, I would say that. And that's what this study is really about. We're, we're trying to figure out how fire spreads and how it behaves and maybe how we can change the forest through prescribed burning or through mechanical thinning uh, to better aid us in having fire do what we want. I mean, fire is a part of this ecosystem and it's never going to go away, but we, we have to limit the severity of those fires for public safety and, and things of that matter. So this, this whole study is really about building better models to make those kinds of predictions. Great. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for all your research, your hard work. Thanks for coordinating this, bringing in the folks from Scotland and England, uh, Rochester Institute of Technology, the um, Worcester University and Worcester Massachusetts Polytech, yeah. Worcester Polytech. Um, so we have a lot of great smart uh, hard-working people here this is part one hopefully next week we'll be able to get out uh, and do some additional plot burning uh, at another location and pick up where we left off today in part two thanks again yeah.